really diligent attempt by people to grapple with what their place in the world is and where where did creation come from and, and the fact that these words weren't handed down by some greater power is absolutely nothing to me. It's the grappling and the trying to understand that I think is significant. I agree with that. But my mind goes to why was that the story then in the first place? Mm -hmm. of why was it this is, these are the words of God? I don't know. Do you want to try to answer your own question? Well, I said I didn't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, but try. I mean, um, it's not just religion that uses a more omnipresent or powerful source or being, <coughs> but uh, that it's kind of like okay, these words you cannot argue with because they are divine. I mean, there are politicians who, have, you know, that, that have started, um, I mean, countries or, or monetary systems, whatever it is, have been based on that. And you read Sapiens, too, which I would love to talk to you about. Sure. Um, so I see the power in it. Hmm. Um, and I think it's definitely... It, it gives inspiration at, or, or something for people to aspire to. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one question to always consider is whether the Torah wants to be read that way. Clearly, the tradition that, you know, the people that, that inherited the Torah, at least some of them want to read it that way. But does the Torah want to be read that way, read that way? Does it, does it purport to be, I mean, I don't know. I don't know that I see that in the text itself. And it's an interesting way, it's an interesting, I think, example of the way that a text can be, you know, utilized in order for people wishing to establish that text as a sacred text. But, but maybe that's not actually what the text is saying. Um, I mean, it seems to me that the Torah, certainly the Bible, if you look at Tanakh, is a multivocal text. Right? Even if, if you believe one author wrote it, divine or human, they certainly certainly were writing in lots of different styles and voices, and sometimes it's legalistic, and sometimes it's narrative, and sometimes it's poetry, and sometimes it's prose. And like if you were writing a book, like it's it's a mess, right? So so anyone reading it, even just the shot, I think you have to say the text is meant to speak in lots of different ways about lots of different things. Back to our question about, about you know, what are the implications of it being a, a human book, at least in some part. So I think, my understanding of that basically, if it's a human book, which <coughs> and that means that the, that has to do with the origins of Judaism were a human creation, as opposed to a direct, um, you know, as, as opposed to a divine creation. And I think that is much more, I, I feel that that's, you know, and I feel that in some ways that can be very empowering. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have trouble believing, you know, if you have questions. Um, mm -hmm. So in some ways the tradition you're saying, if I'm understanding you, John, it's, it's, it's in some ways a stronger tradition because the notion of divine authorship is harder to wrap your head around. But human authorship, like, that actually makes sense, right? So you don't have to right. explain it away, and you can start from... Or, or, uh -huh. or even somebody, but I think it's much more, uh, if it's divine authorship, then basically laying down, this is what it is, this is the way it is, and this is the way it's going to be. As opposed to if it's human authorship that's saying, you know, this is the product of experience, and and, and as a result of our experiences, we just you know we kind of put this out there and created this religion or people or whatever. And 
know, and you're right, maybe it's hard to, you know, it's, you know, it's maybe it's, if you go back to the original origins, you know, what, you know, you know we, we, it was impossible to understand what was happening, what was before the Big Bang, what, what, what this, what was here, I don't know. I mean, that's hard to get your head around, too. So let's, let's actually pivot from there. I think that's a good segue to, to looking at, trying to locate our own understanding of Revelation. Um, and if you looked at page 113 in your source book, um, I hope there's nobody else that's coming out of the door. Does so, somebody want to just take a quick peek and make sure no one's stuck out there? Thank you. Uh, uh, the... So if you look at 113, we're actually going to do this as, a, as an independent <coughs> exercise at first, and then I want you to turn to your Karuta and talk about it a little bit. So, the, so this actually is derived from Elliot Dorff's book on conservative Judaism, and so what's interesting is in a, in a, in a pluralistic context, uh, I always thought that it was sort of interesting that conservative gets, you know, one, two, three... Uh, <laughs> basically four categories and all the rest get one or two. But whatever, um, you know, it's like that old, that old uh, joke, you know, uh, what is it, orthodox, crazy, reform, lazy, conservative, hazy, is the, <laughs> right, which isn't fair to any of the three. But like, yeah, so maybe like conservative Jews, we need more like categories because we can't make up our minds. But whatever the case, or you could think of that in an affirmative way, we're a big tent, but we, those of us who are conservative Jews, are a big tent um, uh, movement. Um, Either way, what I'd like you to do is kind of look at this chart and spend just a few minutes scanning it, reading it to yourself, and see if you can locate your own theology of Revelation. What do you believe about the origin of Torah? Do you agree with any of these things? If you do, which one? If you don't, what would you say instead? And then I'll sort of ask you to talk to your neighbor about it, and then maybe we'll spend a few minutes talking as a full group. So go ahead, it's on two pages, 113 and 114. He wants to identify which of these things we... Correct. If you, if you agree with uh, one of these boxes, which one and why, and if you don't, why not? Okay. And don't worry so much about the labels of movements. I'm less, I'm less interested in the movement labels. I'm more interested in these multiple different ways of, of thinking about divine authors. or about biblical authors. Larry, we never got snacks this nice in, in uh, Peter's school. We just forgot. No, it was not. <clears throat> Once you have an idea, uh, I 
invite you to turn to the person next to you and just spend a couple of minutes sharing where you are and talk about it together. It's all over the place with such a lens. <laughs> I think I started out with B, which is the continuous revelation. <laughs> but and go on, but that comes with every single alignment. Yeah, that you know, that you feel more like putting on the chair and stuff like that. And I kind of agree with most of them, even though they're not. It's just so amazing to have some pieces of a Conservative C and Reform A 
are basically the same, right? They may have different implications about changing law, but in terms of the language, they're very identical. I could concern to see it's the rabbis who have to change it. Ah, uh, when it comes to the right changing yeah, the law. And Mm -hmm. And the community changes in a reform, which I don't really mm -hmm. know what that is. Exactly Reconstruction means. says communal authority, which is sort of like somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. So we're not, you know, I'm not really <laughs> sure. Great. <laughs> so, Excellent. Who else? Well, I, I couldn't get the Katie Klein across. Yeah, not, yeah, there's no bingo here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm actually, but I'm actually like Beth Am. <laughs> We're actually similar. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of like the the humanistic uh, nature of the revelation in terms of historical, political, sociological texts written by Jewish ancestors, um, maybe themselves in search of you know, trying to trying to divine and find, uh, if you will. So I'm not suggesting they made it up out of whole cloth and that they didn't believe. That the laws that they were writing down were, were natural laws, God's laws. Mm -hmm. uh, but but that 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 is, it is my view uh, about the text. Um, but then so so who can change? I know that the reform A. Mm -hmm. um, it's just an ongoing dialogue with the text. Mm -hmm. um, that that everybody can participate. In. Uh, I, I was telling Greg I kind of really bristled at the. At the Orthodox, um, only authorized rabbinic scholars, mm -hmm. um, are, are permitted to make decrees because um, you know, it, it, that assumes a lot in terms of who's authorizing that. Yeah. And, and it affects outcomes. You know, certain, certain dramatic. I mean, I don't think there's any reason to believe that there could be people who are not authorized that might have some. Some revelations from the text. Yeah. Has anyone heard the term Das Torah? Are you familiar with this term? No. Das Torah? It's uh, as in Da'at. Das, like knowledge. Oh, God, God. Da. Hagen Da'at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like Hagen Da'at. Das Torah, Da'at Torah, right? Uh, as in La Da'at, your Da'at. No. So there's this concept within certain circles of orthodoxy where, where you know, rabbis are right because they're rabbis, and therefore they can't be wrong, right? And it's kind of an interesting, it's not, I don't think it's something a conservative rabbi could ever get away with saying, um, <laughs> but it is, a, it is a concept that exists, um, and, uh, you know. Yeah, because I said so. Yeah, it's yeah, really so there is that, it's, right. But it's, it's not because not they said it's so, matter. it's because they have the knowledge to be able to interpret, interpret the text in an authentic way and the inherited tradition. So they wouldn't be claiming that they know because of who they are. They'd be claiming that it, it, it's it's because of what they know and what they represent. Yeah, yeah. This is, yeah. They have a collective yeah. capable of them. Yeah, there's like there is really yeah. that sense. That yeah. That's uh, and point. it just doesn't feel very Jewish. Uh, yeah, that was sort of an interesting thing. So uh, practically yeah. speaking, mm -hmm. what is the difference between the I guess, conservative uh, B and C in terms of changing the law and the reform A. I mean, just how does that get carried out? And what is the role of rabbis in reform A? Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting. Uh, it's a really interesting question. I'm trying to remember what reform A said. Meaning the individual engaged in an ongoing dialogue with the text of the bridge, based on the outcome of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think, so very briefly, because I don't want to spend too much time on, on halacha today, because we'll have other sessions we talk about Jewish law, but in general, the reform movement places the kind of locus of power and decision making in the hands of individual autonomous Jews versus rabbis as inheritors of the tradition asked to play the role as legal decisors for a community. So um, you, know, you could have in Reform A, where the language is identical to Conservative C, 
different implications as to who can actually change so the law. So in the URJ, if there was something that were voted on, lay votes would be involved as well as rabbinic votes? Um, it's, it's, I think it's less that it would be voted on. I think it's generally, it's, unless it's like a policy issue of the movement, right? So yeah, the reform movement did need to make a decision to ordain women or ordain openly gay or lesbian rabbis or, or trans people. Like those were decisions of the movement that were policy decisions. And I, I'm sure that they were informed by their understanding of the sources, of course, but um, but there, but there really not, is not an expectation of individual congregations in the reform movement to follow uh, um, certain prescriptions of, of, of law. So for example, um, you know, whether or not a, a, a congregation has kosher food or not kosher food, is, there's no real kind of centralized authority that's telling individual congregations or their rabbis that they can or can't have shrimp at, at their own egg Shabbat. Right? And, and some do, and some don't, or whether they should wear kippot, or talitot, or different kinds of things like that. Or frankly, about doing interfaith weddings, or about like all of those things are left up to individual rabbis and congregations, uh, you know, themselves. And so it's just kind of a, a different model, because um, the reform movement, but you know what, we can, we can kind of put a pin in that because we can, We'll read Borowitz, I think we'll have a chance to read Borowitz here in just a moment, who's like a leading reform, uh, reform thinker. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to say before we move on, and the reason I wanted you to not only spend some time with this, but also look a little bit at the, like, what, are the, what are the practical ramifications of this, is when we open up discussions, first of all, we notice that People's synagogue affiliations, if you are affiliated with synagogues, may or may not be connected with movement ideology. And we know that sociologically, people join synagogues for all kinds of reasons. And often, the, the, the ideology or the theology of the movement is less important to people in their affiliation than, well, you tell me, what other kinds of reasons do people join synagogues or not? Oh, yeah, so for me, having been <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I raised in, in a reform congregation, but I raised in an Orthodox congregation, uh -huh. and when it came time for me to choose, I chose conservative. And, so the, uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, yeah, uh, it, you know, there's, uh, Beth Alam is Beth Alam, and there are you know, all sorts of, you know, the building, of course. There are things that draw people to Beth Alam, which is what the, the draws, you know, I, I think I've probably always belonged with conservative. Uh -huh. Poverty town, um, and, and you know the, your, the liturgy here, here the, the, com the comfort mm -hmm. with that. Okay, um, so there's but, but, some... but also some of the you know some of the the, the more liberal traditions, but but not you know. Mm -hmm. not, not so there are there are, are kind of cultural like... reasons. There are aesthetic reasons. I'm hearing mm -hmm. maybe I like the music or I like the. Maybe I like the cantor, maybe I like the rabbi, maybe I, my friends go to shul, maybe it's a good location. So people use all kinds of, of factors in, term, in, in making these decisions that may or may not be related. I think what's interesting about looking at this array of different options when we think about um, revelation, right, and, and biblical authorship, is that um, in some ways it opens up the possibility of cloud Israel the possibility of um, the people of Israel beyond our particular view of, of the sources. And I'll give you one kind of example um, that was a tragic example for me recently of what happens when there's really one option. And the option is the text is the text, and there's only one way to understand the text. And therefore, there's only one way to understand Judaism, and there's, therefore, there's only one way to understand a right and a wrong Judaism. Um, we had an interesting process when Beth Am was trying to figure out where our worship swing space was going to be. And we had a, a congregant who was sort of helping broker a conversation with a, a, a historic Orthodox congregation in the area um, that doesn't have a service on Shabbat. Um, 
And, uh, and sitting down with the rabbi, we had a, a, you know, a very pleasant conversation, but it was, it was apparent to me that he and, and, and his rabbeim, right, who were telling him what he may or may not do, for them it was completely black and white, right? The, the no, like, better, better an empty room in a synagogue um, than a room with you know, many Jews worshiping the same God, allowing for Shomer Shabbos people to come and be there. That allows, you know, girls and women to read from the Torah. Um, and it was, it was kind of a tragic reality. Now there were other questions that arose with that particular space, and could we make it work? And I'm not saying it was a foregone conclusion, but, it, but I'd walk by that shul every Shabbos now to get to church. <laughs> and it was a reminder, like a kind of um, eye-opener for me at, at, at what, are the, what are the ramifications of that particular understanding of Torah? A lot of times we think about Torah when we talk about human authorship, we go to a place of, of, of um, so therefore the tradition must be inauthentic. But in some ways the tradition comes to life when we're willing to consider different possibilities, or, and more importantly, when we're willing to make space to be in relationship with those who have different understandings of the text than, than weed. Yeah, it's it's yeah. interesting because the the same building, um, I ended up so because my father in law, um, so my first conversion because I had two, my first conversion was a Philadelphian. So I had a conservative rabbi, reform rabbi, and an orthodox rabbi, and my father in law stated that it wasn't good enough, mm -hmm. and I had to have an orthodox conversion. And I said, well. In order for me to do an orthodox conversion, I should really become orthodox. And I, don't have, I have no plan to become an orthodox. And he said, you need an orthodox conversion. I was like, OK. So I went to that same building, and I sat down with the rabbi, and, um, who happened to work with my mother. Um, and I didn't realize that my mother had a conversation with him at work. At water cooler, to be like, you've been there for months. Um, and, uh, and it was interesting to have to sit there and say, um, to, to be honest and say, I have no plan to become an Orthodox. Mm -hmm. This conversion, this process is happening only to solidify my father-in-law's issues that he has. Mm -hmm. And I understood that his issues had nothing to do with me being Orthodox or not, had other things. But um, to sit there and, and say, you know, I don't want you to give me an answer now, but I'm going to walk away. Mm -hmm. And you can call me and tell me if you're comfortable doing this, and keep in mind that I can still write a very large check. And it, was, it wasn't until that that the body language changed that I, I got an orthodox conversion there. Um, but it was just interesting because it really, which pulled me away from being like, okay, I'm really going to have some hard time being like, you know, you're, you're very specific you know, about what you're doing, but you were allowing something because I was writing a very nice donation to your to your synagogue. Okay. So it was just interesting. All right. I thought a lot though about not just Ju not just Orthodox Judaism, but just really very strict, for lack of another word, religions in general, and really sometimes kind of look at them in awe because all of your answers are there. Mm -hmm. Like there's something so comfort. I mean, to me personally. It, it isn't comforting, but I kind of look at it as this, wow, how would that feel to just know that these are the answers? And, and yeah, so I just wanted to plug that. I don't think it's all bad, although I've, I've, I, I shouldn't say bad, sorry. I've, I've had my own little run-ins too, but um, I, I can see the attraction. Right. Look, I mean, I would, I, I've often thought I would love to, like, build a relationship with some of the rabbis from near Israel. If only they would be willing to build a relationship. Like, uh, for me, that's not a deal breaker, but uh, unfortunately, yeah. the other way around, look, I was talking with a colleague who sits on the VOD, uh, which is, there are, there are two umbrella organizations for rabbis in town. There's, there's the Baltimore Board of Rabbis, which is a, a pluralistic uh, multi-denominational body, and then there's the VOD, which is an orthodox body. 
and this colleague who's on the left end of the orthodox spectrum but sits on the VOD said, you know, one time he was in there and somebody, and he raised the question, he said, well, maybe we should sort of engage uh, some of the other rabbis in town around, around a particular question that had come up. And the response was, there are no other rabbis in town. Yeah. So, right. you know, I, that's a world view. Let's look at Borowitz, because um, Borowitz is going to give us, he's, he's kind of a leading reform thinker from the 20th century, uh, but he's, he's also going to uh, um, outline for us this concept of the documentary hypothesis. And if you remember, somebody brought this up last week, and I said, let's table it for now. We're going to talk more about it. Uh, the notion of, I'm on page one, uh, 99, uh, source number two. We're skipping Kaplan, who is the founder of Reconstructionist Judaism. Um, you know, all of these are worth reading. There's some long passages this week, so there's just not going to be enough time to do all of them. Uh, but Kaplan's worth reading. Kaplan's basically a Kaplan's basically a, a deist. I mean, he doesn't really believe in a commanding God. Uh, he believes that the, you know the Torah is a human a human document, but he believes in. Jewish practice for all kinds of reasons that have more to do with the, the community and the kind of communal norms. He was trained Orthodox. Sure, he was trained Orthodox, and he, and he spent most of his career at JTS, Jewish Theological Seminary, which was conservative. He never intended to create a new movement. He was always, and actually in Dorf's book, the column that says Reconstructionist actually says Conservative for <laughs> parentheses, Reconstructionist, because that's how Kaplan viewed himself. But later, at some point, there was a break, and, and Reconstructionist Judaism became its own thing. Uh, but, but that's Kaplan. I actually think that Kaplan is one of the most important voices in American Judaism, period, uh, and, and, and easily one of the most influential and across the spectrum. That's a conversation for another time. Uh, let's look at Borowitz, though, because I think he lays out this concept of the documentary hypothesis. What I want to do is just kind of go around the room and read, and you can either read a paragraph or skip. But let's just kind of go through this passage, starting with, who wants to start? I will. All right, go for it, Melissa. Thank you. A different understanding of Torah rather than of God or the people of Israel critically divides liberal from traditional Jews. The authors of the Bible and those of the prayer book echoing them say God gave the Torah to the Jews. Liberal Jews take such statements symbolically. The issue goes beyond the first five books of the Bible, the Torah proper, though that alone would be no small matter. Traditional Judaism claims God's authority stood behind the words of all, of all the rest of the Bible and of the oral Torah, the rabbinic law, which has presumably also revealed, was also revealed to Moses and Mount Sinai. A little review. Yes. The Jewish liberalism is characterized by a radical break with the doctrine that had been the foundation of Judaism for about 2,000 years. Jewish orthodoxy, that is the formal statement of a position of correct Jewish belief, arose in the 19th century in response to this revolutionary liberal position. The humanistic view seemed incontrovertible when, uh, when late in the 19th century, Scholars reach a census, consensus as, the, as to the probable origins of the Torah books. Adopted from Julius West Wellhausen's uh, formulations, the documentary hypothesis recognized four basic layers of the Torah, the earliest called J, after its use in the tetragrat, tetra, Tetragrammaton. Yeah. Uh, for God was set down in the, in the 10th century BCE. An E document, 8th centuries, um, eight, I'm sorry, 8th century, 8th, 7th, 8th to 7th century. 8th to 7th century, <laughs> century BCE, so termed because of its performance for for the world, for the word uh, Elohim uh, for God, mm -hmm. appeared uh, 100 years later. By mid century, by mid seventh century BCE, these had been edited into a single document. This was supplemented late in the seventh century BCE uh, with the D strand, substantially the Book of Deuteronomy, but not limited to it. A priestly set of traditions, P, was set down in the sixth fifth century 
BCE. Finally, about 400 years B year 400 BCE, the Torah, as we know, it, was complete. Uh, for the <laughs> For most of the 20th century, the academic acceptance of the documentary hypothesis seemed to provide, seemed to prove the, necess the necessity of a liberal interpretation of Judaism. Time has eroded much of its certainty. Today, scholarly critics point to its eternal and consequences, uh, its erroneous historical assumptions, and the architectural, um, archaeological data which upset some of the older conclusions, yet contemporary Bible students have found no theory which better integrates all the data they still rely upon it, but with considerable caution. And this change of scholarly tone has not increased the liberal's commitment to the human origins of the Bible. The fact and point was the theoretical discussion was not be forgotten. The basic documents of the Jewish faith are essentially human, and so is the authority behind Jewish law. Now, God cannot be, now God cannot be claimed as the final arbiter of what must remain fixed in Jewish observance and what can be offered. With a new view that becomes a matter of our human decision today in response to God is sure, but one in which our minds and hearts will have priority over ancient of precedent. The early liberals intuitively rebelled against the traditionalist rejections of, of modernity. They were simply reasserting the eight old Jewish religious quest. They were seeking to serve God as Jews under the conditions of emancipation, even as previous generations had done so in the land of Israel or in the ghetto. The Jews of the times had adapted their religious insights to the social situation. Modern Jews were merely doing the same. In asserting the humanity of the Bible, they were also putting forth a claim for the, Jew, for the Jewish authenticity of their own modernization of Jews. With all these extraordinary gains, the liberals incurred one great loss. They could no longer say God wanted Jews to follow the Jewish law in all its detail. If the te sacred texts were always human, a distance had opened up between God and a specific purpose and formulation of God's will. Its virtue was that it allowed for human creativity in the face of changing circumstances. And it also raised issues of lasting significance uh, and authority of Bible liberal Judaism, of course. <coughs> You have a basic idea. So the, the documentary hypothesis um, is just that, and it's evolved some over the years in terms of you know when. And there's another source that called the H source, developed by a guy named Yisrael Kanol at Hebrew University. That's the Holiness Code. Um, that uh, it would be um, uh, the Book of Leviticus, parts of the Book of, book of Leviticus, namely the part of Levit Leviticus, the Parsha Kedoshim, right? If you, know, if you remember that Parsha Kedoshim, to you, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That um, uh, he would argue is actually a separate strand written also by priestly authors. Um, and I'm going to give you something at the end that talks about uh, a newer book by the biblical scholar Richard Elliott Friedman, who uh, contends that, in fact, the exodus occurred with a priestly group of people, namely the Levites, who then kind of glommed on, because the word Levi actually means attached to, glommed on to it, uh, and they brought with them their beliefs in this, va this god called yud heh vav -Hey, right? The tetragrammaton is just a fancy word of saying the four-letter name for God, and they connected their belief in yod heh vav -Hey with another uh, group of people who are already living in Canaan, who are indigenous to the land of Israel, to Canaan, who believed in this God called Elohim, and together they combined, and then what grew out of them was this um, uh, Levitical uh, um, uh, cast of priests who served in a particular family that was Aaron's Moses' family. But, so there are different theories, different hypotheses about the origin of, of the Jewish community and also about the origin of the sources. Um, but suffice it to say, what we have here is multiple authors 
uh, or multiple schools of authorship that get edited together at somewhere around the year 400 BCE. And then that gets appended to other books of the Bible, um, which the latest books of the Tanakh were written in about the second century um, before the Common Era. So by the time of the, you know, the second, first century, we now have a canonization process of the Bible and a, and a final version so, around that So time. what you're yeah. saying is, is that, so actually, the Torah as we know it was not complete at the time of the first temple. The Torah as we know it was complete at the time of the first temple. Okay. Um, the first temple was what? It was. Was 400? Or? Well, the first temple was built in, in the 10th century, and it was destroyed in the 6th century. BC. BC, BC exactly. So, if, so 400 BC is actually way after the first temple then. Correct. Yeah, so by the time the, the Torah the is actually temple, written, yeah. the first temple has been destroyed, and we're already on to the second so, temple. So, so then how do you have to reconcile the very careful the definitions of all the sacrifices in the temple with... If the temple right. So done. Friedman would say these are stories that were passed on as oral traditions that were later written down. Right? He's not saying that Sinai didn't happen. He's saying Sinai did happen. It just happened with a small group of people who were fleeing slavery in, front, in Egypt. And they had a particular cult worship of their god, who they called yud heh vav -He, and they then imported that belief to an indigenous population in the land of Israel who bought into that idea, and then they together continued to develop over time, but the Torah we get is actually a, a combination. That, that doesn't mean, remember, when we're talking, these things didn't sort of come out of nowhere, right? Yeah. These were passed on traditions, sometimes passed on sources, uh, even recited poetry and things like that. So. Anyway, I don't want to go too far into the particulars of it, one, because I'm not a biblical scholar, um, but also because um, it, less important to our topic tonight is the, all the details of how the Torah came together. What's more important is this notion of how having this multivocal text actually can offer us something uh, perhaps more robust uh, than, than an original version. And the, and the best way to do this is to actually look at the story of Noah. Uh, now, for anyone who thinks, if we're on, I'm on page 102, for anyone who thinks that, um, that uh, the rabbis were unaware of contradictions in the text, you really only have to read Genesis <laughs> to see that you'd have to be a complete idiot to, to, to not notice that there are inconsistencies, there are blatant contradictions in the text. They were clearly aware of them. Sometimes, oftentimes, they'll explain them away, but they were clearly aware of them. And so the question that we want to ask ourselves is, why are they there? What's the value? Because whoever put the Torah together, whether it was God or it was human beings and a great R, we didn't put R on there, but R is the redactor, right? the editor, the person or school that put all of these different disparate sources together into the, the, um, the text that we have today, um, these, you know, whoever did that um, was clearly not stupid. I mean, they must have known, they could have rewritten it in ways that would make it much easier to digest. So they didn't do that, which begs the question, were they interested in consistency at all? And I would submit to you the answer to that is definitively no. That actually consistency and the notion of consistency is a much more modern concept, and actually the ancients were not interested in consistency. They were much more interested in conversation. What's and they were very interested in text being in conversation with one another. What's that? Isn't there some Don Viking who said it that consistency is the hobgoblin, hobgoblin of little minds, minds, right? Yeah. Yes. I forget whose quote that is, though. Emerson? I think you're right. It's Emerson. I want to say Emerson. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it, it, it's something like mindless consistency. Yes. Oh, is that? Yes. Okay. So consistency is okay. <laughs> Okay, so, well, or, or maybe we'll go to Whitman, right? What did Walt Whitman say? I, am I, do I contradict to myself? Very well, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes, right? <laughs> what a great description of God, right? Why can't God be large and containing multitudes, right? 
the, to the tablet says, these and those are the words of the living God. So who decided that God has to be so simple and so limited, and therefore God's te te text has to be so simple and so limited as to tell only one story and not another story? So let's look at, at the story of Noah, which we might think is actually one story, but in fact is two stories that were edited together. So if you look on page, I, uh, we don't have time to do all of this, so I want to look at the end before we do it. But look on page 107, and you'll see we have two different stories that are woven together in Parshat Noah. The first one is the J source, right? The J source is one of the oldest sources. That's a 10th century BCE source. The, one of the ways you know it's the J, right, is J stands for yud heh vav -Hey, pronounced by those who would say that name, but I try not to say that name. But you get the basic idea. Um, this was developed by, Wellhausen was not Jewish. In fact, he was, uh, some would say that the earliest biblical critics were interested in disproving the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, in order to prove the Christian Bible. Um, some of them yes, some of them no. That's less important than what the, whether they were right. And, you know, they may have been right. Okay. Um, about about uh, uh, human in, uh, influence in, in biblical authorship. So you'll see yud heh vav -Hey is the name for God. Uh, the sex of the animals, it says, are male and female. Um, the description of the device, it says everything died. He's used the word mate, men, tough. Number of pairs of animals <laughs> are seven pairs of pure, one pair of impure. Okay. Um, how long did the flood last? 40 days, 40 nights. Sound familiar? What did Noah send out of the ark? A dove? And the depiction of God is human-like qualities. And that makes sense for a 10th century source, because the earlier sources tend to have a much more anthropomorphic view of God. Later sources, when we're already into the temple having been established, to John's point, are much less interested in any anthropomorphic images of God or depictions of God because at this point we're now into temple ritual and when you worship, one of the things that Canole talks about is Canole, the, the one who came up with the H um, source, the holiness code, is he says he has a, a, a book called The Sanctuary of Silence where he talks about how but what was really interesting about the Jewish worship is that in the sanctuary, the, it was a, it, there's no word, there are all kinds of words and prayers said outside, but the sanctuary itself, the Holy of Holies, is a place of silence, and it's also not a place of any images, it's just a place of some space, and the ark was there, and then when the ark disappears, guess what happens? What do they do in the second temple period when the holy ark is gone? Do they get rid of the Holy of Holies? No, it's just an empty room, right? So we have a kind of evolution of monotheism from what you might call henotheism to a pure monotheism and what away from anthropomorphism. It doesn't mean that they, what's that? What is henotheism? Henotheism is just, it, is, is sort of an earlier version of monotheism. Instead of believing that there's only one God and there's nothing else, you believe that I have a particular God and that God can have a relationship with a particular place and particular people, um, but actually that God can maybe even have dominion in other places. And that was kind of the revolution early on, was that you know God can encounter Abraham in Mesopotamia and tell him to go to Canaan, uh, instead of just like, if you're in Mesopotamia, you worship those gods, and if you're in Canaan, you worship those gods, okay? So anyway, if you look at the priestly source, which is already like 500 years later, the name for God is Elohim, it's man and wife, it's the word um, Yagua, uh, perished instead of mate, one pair of every kind instead of seven pairs, the pure ones, what, one year and 10 days, and it was a raven and not a dove, and the depictions of God are transcendent. So let's just read a little bit of this, because we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, someone, uh, let's just read, well, you know what, for the sake of time, let me do it. So I'm, I'm in the small text, this is the J source on page 102. The Lord saw how great God, uh, great was man's wickedness on earth, and how every plan devised by his mind was nothing but evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made uh, man on earth, and his heart was sad. And the Lord said, I will blot out of the earth the, man, the men whom I created, men together with beasts, creeping things, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. And now skip ahead. 
Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark and all your household, for you alone have found righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean animal you'll take, you shall take seven pairs, male and males and their mates, and of every animal that is not clean too, and a male and its mate. Of the birds of the sky also seven pairs, male and female, to keep seed uh, alive upon the earth. For in seven days' time I will make it rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the earth all the existence I created. And Noah did just as the Lord commanded him. Noah with his sons, his wife, his son's wife went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And on the seventh day the waters of the flood came upon the earth, and so on and so forth. So that's version one. Okay, now it's not a complete story. You notice there was no building of the ark. It's not that there wasn't a building of the ark in that source. It's what likely happened to the building of the ark in the J source. The editor went with the, it's just the editor went with the P source, right? So you can't read these as if they're complete stories, because somebody edited these together and said, well, I can't tell the story of building the ark maybe exactly twice, but there, you'll see that there is some redundancy. So listen now to the P source. This is the line of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his age. Noah walked with God. Right. Uh, back in 102. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth became corrupt before God. The earth was filled with lawlessness. Notice we're not saying Lord, we're saying God. In Hebrew, it's yod vav versus Elohim. yod vav being a proper name of God. Elohim, our understanding now being a general name of God, but in those days might have also been El, which is the Canaanite name for the male day. Okay. Baal, you put the name Baal, is not a day. Baal just means male god. El is an actual guy, an actual god. Okay, so El becomes Elohim. Um, and God said to Noah, I've decided to put an end to all flesh, for the earth is filled with lawlessness. Because of them, I'm about to destroy them. With the earth, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make its ark with compartments, cover it inside and out with a pitch. It goes on and on for a while about the details. There's an opening in it. Um, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark with your sons, your wife, your sons' wives, and all that lives, all your flesh, you shall take, not seven, two of each into the ark to keep alive with you. They shall be male and female. From birds of every kind, cattle of every kind, every kind of creeping thing on earth. If, there, if it were every kind, then what's this whole thing about seven, right? But if you have two sources, oh, all of a sudden it actually makes a little bit more sense. For your part, take everything that is eaten and store it away to serve as food for you and for them. Noah did so just as God commanded him, so he did. Going on, Noah was 600 years when the flood came, waters upon the earth. Of the clean animals, of the animals that are not clean, of the birds, and of everything that creeps on the ground, two of each male and female came to Noah in the ark as God had commanded Noah. Okay. Interesting. They actually read pretty clearly as two different stories. And the same is true if you read Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 about the creation of the world, where there seem to be two different stories that somebody decided, not, to, not let's erase one of them, or not let's combine them into something which is completely meaningless, but let's hold in tension these two traditions and see if we can bring them into conversation with one another. We're running uh, out of time, and I want to make sure that we have time for a break before Miriam's class. I would normally do more discussion right now. Any real quick reactions to this before I wrap us up? So, uh, if you take a very strict, uh, you know, you know non-changing, you know, have you worked out, how, how, would, how do you reconcile this? Because this, 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 these are just examples. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember hearing, well, it's, we don't understand. You know, um, so they're going to do kind of different things. You know, I mean, the, the traditional commentators are going to say, well, if you read it, what it really means is 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 the specific part that says seven of every clean kind is 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 making specific the general statement two of every kind. So it's two of every kind, but for the clean animals, right. you should take seven of every kind. Okay. By the way, there's a very practical reason why you need seven of every kind. Why? The week. Well, or at least you need more than one. What's that? You're if you're going to sacrifice some of them, which is what happens after they get off of the boat, right. uh, it, would be, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to wipe out an entire species right from the get-go uh, by getting rid of some. So, when they, when, so if you want to make the case that animal sacrifice begins 
at the conclusion of the flood, which the Torah does make that case, you're going to want to uh, make sure that you've got some reserves. Okay? Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different ways that they try to work their way around it. And by the way, I actually think the process of trying to explain the contradictions in the text is a holy process and an important one. I'm not trying to discount that. And actually, that leads me to my conclusion here. So I don't typically like hand around sermons, and you're not required to read this. Um, but, <laughs> but I will quiz you on it next time. Um, so this is a sermon I gave on the second day of Rosh Hashanah this year. And it's called Taking on Rabbi Yonatan's Difficult Text, Difficult Questions. And the subtext of what we've been talking about today is also then, if, if the text is, is, is not entirely divine, what advantage to that approach is it also lets God off the hook. For those of us who want to believe that, oh, is there not enough? Uh, there's probably more coming on this one. I guess there's another one. I've got it. Um, for those who, of us who want to believe in a God, right, whatever you believe that means, um, and yet read this book and say, you know what, I've got some problems with some of these sources. What's this thing about a guy who's asked by this God to sacrifice his son? What kind of a God would ask someone to kill their son, who, by the way, they've been praying to have for so many years, and finally blesses them and says, you're going to be a great nation, and then wants to take all that away for absolutely no good reason other than to test you? What kind of a, a capricious, lousy God is that? How can I believe in that God? How can I believe in a God who wants us to stone our rebellious children uh, for being rebellious? Right? And what I try to do with this sermon is to offer us a different way of thinking about this. That actually difficult texts are there in order to continue what the Torah was always meant to do in the first place, which is to get us to grapple with how do we lead holy lives. And if the Bible only gave us vanilla stories about things that don't matter and don't challenge our assumptions about the world or doesn't reflect the actual world in which we live, it wouldn't be a very interesting book, and it wouldn't have had a lot of staying power. But a, but a book that offers us the, the question of child sacrifice in a world where once people regularly did sacrifice their children in certain cultural contexts, and in a modern world when people do all kinds of things to their children, um, including sell them into slavery or abuse them, Etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If we don't have a story like the Akedah or the Ben Sorera More, the rebellious child, to, to, to confront every year, we're, we're not really uh, doing anything interesting with our holy texts. So, anyway, if you're interested in it, feel free to take a, a read. And it also weaves together some of what I talked about with Richard Elliott Friedman's new book on the Exodus, um, where he brings in some of his theories. So, that's also in this particular. Uh, just because I know that like not everybody comes on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, so I just in case remember, you missed it. I, I remember now the restaurant. I remember it was a good sermon. But yeah. I don't remember anything else. Fair enough. So now you have. I'm gonna. I think this is my wife saying, "Come, let me in." So everybody take a break, and then you'll get to learn about my parents. And by the way, Larry, the milk was a nice touch. I, I don't think I've had an actual like cup of milk in a long time. That was really nice. Isn't that a great question? <laughs> <laughs> was it J? Was it P? Was it no, well, I mean, no, but was there a was there a movement? You know, because, you know. Right, right. I don't. I don't yeah. know if somebody knows, but uh, but I don't know. Um, I know that we sort of in the development of um, of Jewish law and practice, um, we codify what an experience, what what observance of Shabbat means, what rest means, and we're going to look at that next week. But um, I th I, you know, when I think about it, this idea of rest might be our greatest gift to the world. Um, it's, it's radical. And it, we, we don't think about it because it's so, like, since Hebrew school, it's Shabbat, 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 right? But it's a radical idea to, to stop. 
and I, I, I teach another class right now. Uh, anyone know the work of Brene Brown? Mm -hmm. yeah. So she's a sociologist, storyteller, anthropologist who studies sh uh, shame and vulnerability. Um, amazing, amazing uh, teacher. And she um, taught a class on Monday night about productivity and how much we measure our, our lives by our productivity. And that it, she, she says, like, if you um, talk to someone and you know you say, how are you? And they say, oh, I'm great. I took a nap today. I went to the gym. I made myself you know, a healthy stir salad for lunch. And you're like, what the heck is this person doing all day, right? Because there's nothing productive in any of, in any of those things, but we tend to judge ourselves and judge one another by our productivity. But maybe that's not the measuring system. Uh, I'm going to take that back to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> are you um, recording that? Where are you teaching? <laughs> what, what, where are you teaching? I teach at the Soul Center. Oh. It's a creative yeah. journaling. So, oh, okay. so I know that, you know, as a nurse, we're three, you know, working three 12-hour shifts a week, but um, we're under contract time, and so I tend to work sometimes four, sometimes five days a week, 12-hour shifts. And um, this class, has given me, has also forced me to have a day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for instance, today I was able to, like, so I wake up to a text message from my wife, a list of things to do. <laughs> and I was kind of like, are you serious? Because I did. Did you just do it? She's like, all those things are, she told take you like a total of like 45 minutes. I was like, it's my day of rest. <laughs> like, I have to work Friday. I might be called in on Saturday. Like, this is my day. And she's like, okay. And then she realizes because it's really important because I don't have an opportunity to recharge. Um, and so having the fact that I have 26 days this year, that is definitely do nothing. You know, except take my kids. I'm not getting in the middle of that. Oh, no, 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 no. we worked it out, but she was saying how she I don't know my she's, she's trying to, well, I was thinking that. I was thinking that. She, she does say that, too. But she recognizes that, you know, I, I am on, yeah. you know, for 12 hours for five to six people, you know, and that it's necessary. Um, and since I started this class, like, when I go to work on Friday or Saturday or, you know, that next shift, I'm actually a little more revived than I have been because I am taking an entire, even though I'm up later than I like to be before my shift, but I, I actually am taking a full <coughs> day. Yeah. Yeah, it's a gift. <laughs> it's a gift. Um, and we're going to talk in a little bit about whether there are different ways to think about Shabbat. Does the whole week lead up to Shabbat? Is it, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat? Or is Shabbat the climb, like the middle of the week, like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat, mm -hmm. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then we start up again? Mm -hmm. um, so what, what role, where does Shabbat rest fit into the rhythm of our lives? We're going to get to that. I was just going to say, um, this became very apparent to me. Shabbat, first of all, really hard to get used to, not using the computer or the phone. It, it took a while, because I'm a non-stop person. But in the last Thursday, I couldn't get out of bed. Literally, could not <coughs> have. I worked myself into such exhaustion because I was working weird shifts and stuff. So I've now said I can only work until 9 p.m., eight, Sunday through Tuesday, 8 p.m. on, for, I mean, 8 p.m. on Wednesday and then 4 p.m. on Thursday, which I already had, because the concept of rest and getting my body was working all these night shifts was just making me exhausted mm -hmm. and it was really detrimental. So the importance of rest We're is talking major. about boundaries. Mm -hmm. and boundaries are really hard to put up and even harder to sustain. Mm -hmm. um, let's look at text five here, which we're going to jump all the way ahead to Deuteronomy. And as we, as we read it, I want to ask you to think about what's the difference between this and the, the text from Exodus that we just 
red. So they're, they're pretty similar. Um, with one. Is that maybe. more of a shamble, right? Hmm? Is that more of a shamble? Nope, not there yet. I mean, that, yes, but that's not what we're going to focus on now. Next week, we'll do that part. Somebody read uh, 12 to 15. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Am I the right mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your ox or your ass, or any of your cattle, or the stranger in your settlement, so that your male and female slave may rest as you do. Remember, um, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God freed you from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So why Shabbat? Because we were slaves. Right, so we started with creation, right? Now we're looking at why do we have to stop? Because we know what it's like not to. We know what it's like not to be able to make those choices about our, our own lives and livelihood. Um, I'll just point out one other thing here. If you look at the end of verse 14, it says, so that your male and female slaves may rest as you do. What do those words say to us, the as you do? It's not like treating the slaves like property. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and every, um, uh, every seven years, we're instructed to release our slaves on the grounds that we were slaves in Egypt. Um, and so we do the same thing once every seven days, um, which is supposed to, you know, in some ways, as I was preparing for this class, I was reading the faculty guide, which talks about sort of a recognition of, of the humanity of others. And then I, I have this other voice going in my head. But yeah, we, we were still owning slaves. Like there's something that's kind of morally amiss about that. Um, but in the context of the culture of that time, um, I think what what the Torah is trying to say to us is we have to find ways to recognize the humanity in the practice that we now understand to be a born. Make sense? Okay. So lessons from slavery. Now I'm gonna ask you to take a deep breath. And we're going to um, leave our smash behind a little bit now that we've gotten a, a dabbling into the primary sources. Um, I'm going I'm to read you text eight, but I'm, it's, a, it's an imagery text. So I'm going to ask you to put your feet on the ground, take a deep breath, and if you're not going to fall asleep, close your eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take a deep breath in and out. And in and out. According to the Genesis account, this world originally was and is still meant to be a paradise. But only when there is peace with abundant resources and an untrammeled right to live will the world be structured to sustain the infinite value of a human being. This is the heart of Judaism, the dream. Jewish existence without the dream is almost inconceivable. The drawing power of the vision has kept Jews faithful to their mission over several millennia. 
Expulsion, persecution, and destruction have assaulted but never obliterated the dream. Jews have repeatedly given everything, including their very lives, to keep it alive. And when catastrophe shattered the vision, Jews spent their lives renewing it. The question is, from where can these people draw the strength to renew their dream again and again? The answer of Jewish tradition is, give people just a foretaste of the fulfillment, and they will never give it up. The Shabbat is that taste. The world of the Shabbat is totally different than the weekday universe. There is no work to do, no deprivation. On Shabbat, there is neither anxiety nor bad news. Since such a world does not yet exist in space, it is first created in time, on the seventh day of the week. Jews travel through time in order to enter a perfect world for a night and a day. The goal is to create a reality so complete and absorbing that these time travelers are caught up in its values and renewed. The Shabbat is the foretaste of the messianic redemption. But even as this enclave of perfection is carved out in the realm of time, the world goes on as usual in the realm of surrounding space. This is why Shabbat needs a community in order to be credible. By an act of will, the community creates this sacred time and space and agrees to live by its rules. For 1,900 years, before saying grace after meals on weekdays, Jews in exile chanted Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But on Shabbat, as the sun set and the power of evil was shut out, Jews were transported in their imagination to a perfect, rebuilt Jerusalem. It was so real to them that on this day, before saying grace, they sang Psalm 126. When the Lord returned us to Zion, we lived as in a dream, then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongue flowed with song. The Shabbat comes to an end weekly, but it creates an appetite and a satisfaction that lasts through the week until it is renewed again. So take another deep breath in and out and think for a moment what your redeemed world would look like. What is the taste of the world to come that you want to access on Shabbat? So what's your dream? <coughs> Brush stroke. What do you see in that perfect world? No conflict. Everyone has everything they need, including a day of rest or some kind of rest. sense of community. Yeah, healing of the divisions that we experience now. This is a totally me kind of answer, but people singing together. <laughs> Just take the word but out of that sentence, and we're good. Make the word 
word but out. A me answer is a good answer. Every child can have what they need and grow up loved without violence. So we talked last week about how in the Amidah for Shabbat we take out all those requests in the middle, the middle 13 requests, and we replace it with one bracha of a blessing about the holiness of the day. <coughs> and that's what this is about. Shabbat is supposed to be that taste of the perfect world so that we can keep the dream alive amidst the shattered pieces of the world of space in which we live now. So next week when we talk about observance, the question I'm going to ask you is I'm going to ask you to come back to these images and the question it, one of the questions is how does our observance help us to access that experience, that taste, that taste of Allah Hamba. Any other thoughts, questions, comments about the dream? I think is, is in a lot of ways about hope. Being able to see what what we so wish for. It creates resilience. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to um, leave the readers for, for a little bit here. And I brought you um, a smattering of um, Shabbat messages from um, different, mostly, uh, mostly modern um, uh, rabbis and teachers. And this is how we're going to do it. Um, in, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person sitting next to you and identify which one of you wants to be the traveler and which one of you wants to stay where you are. I'm better word for it. And what we're going to do is I'm going to read, um, read one of the texts and then you're going to have two minutes with your partner to talk about um, that particular image and to, to answer the questions what does this mean and what does it mean to me? And then after two minutes, the traveler is going to move to the next set of partners so that by the time we get through all of them, you will have had a conversation with like six, six, we are 12 of us, so six different people. Make sense? So the questions will be what does it mean and what does it mean to me? Is it helpful if I write that on the board? And what does it mean will sometimes be obvious and sometimes need a little bit of unpacking. But the, question, the, the big question and what does it mean to me is about the resonance. Um, and we're looking for messages and meanings that um, add to each of our understanding of an experience of Shabbat. Okay, so we're at even number, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so turn to the person next to you. Um, and the travelers, you can take your sheets with you so that you. Yeah. you no, I'm on the end. So Wait, yeah, you, yeah. you two. We'll start, and then one of you will travel around. I can travel around. All right, everybody's got your partner. And I'm gonna um, I'm gonna time us because I want. I'm, I'll be happy to travel. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> it means that when I when I say times up, you're gonna move to this. To I know what it means. Yeah, are we going this? Yeah. Way? We're gonna go this. Way. It's like a duck duck goose or whatever. Yeah, it's something like that. I'm going to read them because okay. I because I think it will be it will be easier that way. Okay. Um, okay. 
I'm actually, I'm going to give us maybe a minute and a half because I want to do two minutes. I'll do two minutes. We'll do what we do. Okay. So, sub, so number A, Abraham Joshua Heschel. Judaism is a religion of time aiming at the sanctification of time. Judaism teaches us to be attached to holiness in time, to be attached to sacred events, to learn, I think that's supposed to be, to learn how to consecrate sanctuaries that emerge from the magnificent stream of a year. The Sabbaths are our great cathedrals. The meaning of the Sabbath is to celebrate time rather than space. Six days a week, we live under the tyranny of things of space. On the Sabbath, we try to become attuned to holiness in time. It is a day in which we are called upon to share in what is eternal in time, to turn from the results of creation to the mystery of creation, from the world of creation to the creation of the world. Two minutes. to ennoble the human race, but to humble it. With its incessant strictures against work, Shabbat reminds us of our earthly status as tenant and not overlord. To rest is to acknowledge our limitations. One day out of seven, we cease to exercise our power to tinker and transform. Willful inactivity is a statement of subservience to a power greater than our own. On the meaning of Shabbat, Samson Raphael Hirsch, the hardliner, spoke more intelligently than his liberal counterpart. This is funny, because Shorsh is also a hardliner. <laughs> On each Sabbath day, the world, so to speak, is restored to God. And thus man proclaims, both to himself and to his surroundings, that he enjoys only a borrowed authority. Even the smallest work done on the Sabbath is a denial of the fact that God is the creator and master of the world. Go. Well, that was clear. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Shabbat was created as a tool for perpetual self-renewal. The next time you wonder about the value of Shabbat, remember the beach in the Club Med ad. Go. Uh,
success. Fairly soon, What you have made, what you have spoiled, let go. Let twilight empty the crowded rooms, quiet the jostling colors to hues of swirling water, pearls of fog. This is the time for letting time go, like a released balloon dwindling. Tilt your neck and let your face open to the sky like a pond catching light drinking the darkness. Thank you for being here.
long years ago.